everyone. Really excited to be here. I think uh, we've got a long day ahead, but the talk so far have been really uh, insightful, and I think it's great that we're uh, talking about the crowd today. So, you know, it's great talking about the crowd and what it can do to disrupt the world, but what is the crowd doing in terms of online alternative finance? So, um, you know, that's my job today, you know, answering questions like, how is it evolving? Uh, is it doing what we want it to do? What countries are good at it? And, uh, you know, what platforms are thinking about risks and regulation? So my name is Alexis Lowe. I'm a researcher and uh, outreach manager at the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance. Uh, and I'll be using findings from our latest report, Sustaining Momentum, to help you answer some of those questions. So first off, just to give you a bit of background about the report. So it's a long report, 84 pages, and it took four months to complete. It required five full-time researchers, eight research assistants, and 17 major European organizations, uh, many of whom are here today. And they're actually based in the countries that we study. Uh, we, st we covered about 90% of the market, we reckon 90% of the market, uh, over 30 32 European countries, covering 367 platforms, including the UK, and 273 platforms, excluding the UK. And I only make that distinction because of the size and maturity of the UK, and not because of Brexit. So the scope of alternative finance, obviously, is extremely large. But we focus on uh, 10 specific models. So that's in column one of this table. As you can see, we made three new additions uh, on top of our taxonomy from last year, our report moving mainstream. And those were real estate crowdfunding, balance sheet business lending, and profit sharing crowdfunding. In the third column, you can see the volumes of the individual uh, models. And again, this is excluding UK data. You can see in first place was peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending with 36% of the market. Second place was peer-to-peer -peer business lending with 21% of the market. And third was equity crowdfunding with 16%. So actually, in 2015, these three models alone uh, covered over th well, almost three quarters of the European market. So now the numbers that you've all been waiting for, how large was the European market in 2015? So it was 5.4 billion euros, up 92% from 2.8 billion euros in 2014. Um, yes, the, the, the rate of growth slowed from 151% to 92%, but 92% is still huge in comparison to most other industries. The UK made up the majority uh, of, this, of this volume. So in 2015, the UK was uh, accounted for 81% up from 75% in 2014. But what happens if we remove the UK? So if we remove the UK, you can see that the rest of Europe actually uh, achieved a huge milestone and crossed the 1 billion euro barrier for the very first time. The growth rate uh, in 2013 to 2014 was 82%, and it slowed slightly down to 72%. But you can see that the slowdown is a lot more subtle when compared to the previous graph which suggests to me that the EU is still continuing on a very strong and stable trajectory. Now let's look at it in terms of a global context. You can see that Europe in the, the dark blue is actually the smallest when compared to other global regions. So we also study the Americas and the Asia Pacific region. So in the Americas in 2015, it, uh, there was 33.5 billion euros of volume. And in 2015 for the Asia Pacific region, which includes China, it was 95 billion euros. So in other words, the Americas was six times larger, and the Asia Pacific region was 17 times larger. But actually, there's a distinctive leader in each of these global regions. In Europe, it's the UK. In the Americas, it's the US. And in the, in the Asia Pacific region, it's China. So what happens if we take these, these leaders out? Actually, it shows that in 2015, the, the Europe, again excluding the UK, was just, just behind Asia Pacific, so second to Asia Pacific, um, which is better than the previous story. Now, if we look at the total volume per model, you can see that when you look at 2014 to 2015, the models, generally speaking, retain their positions, except for reward-based crowdfunding, which moved down from second to fourth, and donation-based crowdfunding, which moved down from fifth to seventh. Invoice trading was the highest, uh, in terms of the three-year growth rate at 
Um, and, but if we dive a little bit deeper, if we just look at the 2014 to 2015 growth rate, it tells uh, an interesting story. So actually, there were only three models that grew faster in this period, and they were equity crowdfunding, invoice trading, and debt-based securities, which leaves donation, reward, peer-to-peer -peer consumer, and peer-to-peer -peer business lending uh, actually slowing down. If you look at peer-to-peer -peer business lending, the slowdown was from 135% uh, between the years 2013-2014 down to 128%. Whereas for peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, it slowed from 75% to 33%. So this is an extremely develop, uh, important development that we're going to keep monitoring. But if this trend continues, then we may see that peer-to-peer -peer business lending takes first, first place, overtaking peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending for the very first time. Now, for a bit of healthy and friendly competition, let's look at the top three countries by model. So you can see, for peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, Germany and France leads the way by quite a bit. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it, well, for peer-to-peer -peer business lending, it's the Netherlands. Uh, in France, you've got equity crowdfunding and reward-based crowdfunding, so they lead the way in that. In Germany, their first place for real estate crowdfunding and donation-based crowdfunding. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, uh, Belgium is first for invoice trading. So if we take a look at the, uh, if we rank the total market volume across all models, uh, you, please be aware that this is using a logarithmic scale. You can see in first place you've got the UK, then you've got France, then Germany, then Netherlands. But if we take a more nuanced understanding and actually look at the level of adoption of alternative finance in these individual countries, by dividing the volume by the population, you get the online alternative finance volume per capita. So what happens to the rankings? So this slide just shows, keep an eye on the red ones and the green ones. So the red ones are moving down, the green ones are moving up. Uh, let's just have a look. So now what happens is the UK is still in first place, but Estonia is now in second place with, um, with 24 euros per capita. And Finland is now second place, third place, sorry, with 11.6 euros per capita. Compared to the previous graph, which showed France and Germany in second and third place, according to this method, they're now in seventh and tenth place. So if we take this analysis, analysis even further um, and actually incorporate the relative economic strength of these individual countries, we, we can create a chart, which is personally one of my own favorite ones, that looks a bit like this. So on the y-axis, again, it's logarithmic. Um, you have the online alternative finance volume per capita. On the x-axis, you have the GDP per capita. So looking at that line of best fit, countries above that line uh, actually have a higher contribution of alternative finance per person in contrast to the GDP per capita. More specifically, if you're in the top left of that chart, then you have a higher penetration of alternative finance in your country, whereas in the bottom right, uh, it's the opposite. So you can see in the top left, you actually have quite a few Eastern and Central European countries uh, with Estonia leading the pack. There are many reasons for this, uh, many reasons for why different countries might be in different positions in this chart. Um, for example, uh, what are the models that dominate that particular country, or what's the regulatory environment like for the platforms within that country. But this is um, definitely a space that's very exciting, and one we'll be monitoring and measuring uh, to find more answers for you. Moving on to business funding. So in terms of business funding, um, it increased substantially from 2014 to 2015 to reach uh, five, well, over 500 million euros, which is about half the European market. So the growth rate was 167%, which is more than double that in the previous period. If we inspect these volumes closer and tease out the equity and debt-based funding, we get this graph. So you can see that the, the volumes are actually dominated by lending-based models, um, such as peer-to-peer uh, -peer business lending, invoice trading, debt-based securities, and uh, balance sheet business lending. Uh, coincidentally or not, if you take the ratio between the growth rates, um, you actually get a number around 1.7. So what that means is debt-based business finance grows, well, grew at 1.7 times faster than equity-based business finance from the period 2013 to 2015. Now, institutionalization. It was a hot topic, and it still is a hot topic. So not only does inst do institutions provide funding for fundraisers, but it's also a sign of maturity of the on online alternative finance space. 
um, as institutions start to invest in on alternative finance as, an, as a real asset class. So there are three angles that we looked at. The three angles that we looked at were the provision of funding, the proportion of funding of platforms that was from institutions, and finally, the ownership of these platforms. So you can see here, it shows the um, proportion of funding, so, sorry, the, the, the percentage of platforms that showed some level of institutional funding through their platform. So you can see there's a gradual increase from 24% to 33 to 44%, so about one third increase every year. If we look at the individual models, you can see that in institutional, uh, institutional funding was driven by debt-based models, uh, which well, except for equity-based crowdfunding, which is also there. So peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending, 26% of the funding that went through those platforms was from institutions, so institutions being hedge funds, mutual funds, family offices, et cetera. Closely behind it was peer-to-peer -peer business lending, with 24% of its funding from institutions. And then uh, in first place, you actually have invoice trading with 37%, which is maybe not surprising since they actually require a high level of higher level of sophistication uh, from, its, from its investors before they can invest. Looking at ownership, moving, so moving from investment through the platform but into the platform itself, you can see that peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending platforms had the highest level of any kind of institutional ownership. So 10%. At, uh, of platforms said that a majority of their shares were owned by VCs, 6% said a majority was owned by a major corporation, and quite interestingly, 13% of peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending platforms uh, have a majority shareholder that's an institution. We, if we uh, look at real estate crowdfunding, if you remember, I said that this was a new addition to our taxonomy. What's interesting is it has the highest number of platforms at 45% reporting uh, some level of, well, a majority ownership in their, in their company. Uh, and this is quite interesting because I guess it's institutions wanting to move into this space, have a slice of the industry, and maybe cement itself as a potential leader while competition is still low and maybe while there's still a lot of upside. Now let's just quickly look at auto selection. So this is a subtle yet interesting development. So in the very early days, most platforms didn't have this feature of auto selection. Um, what would happen would, would be platforms would put their deals or projects on their platform and wait for investors to come along, log in, sign up, pick the deal they wanted, and then fund it. But as the industry has developed, what's happened is platforms are starting to use this more or exclusively use this feature. And what it means is um, they are now investing the funds on behalf of the investor, as long as it meets the requirements of the investor, such as the loan to value, the interest rate, maybe the duration of the loan. So um, you can see here that peer-to-peer -peer consumer lending and invoice trading rely heavily on this feature at 82% and 78% respectively. So when we think of online alternative finance, we often think about how it's competing with traditional bank lending. But looking at this, looking at this feature, um, it suggests that in a sense, these platforms are acting as asset managers, managing the client's funds and investing it on their behalf. So we reckon that these numbers will go up over time, and it's just simply down to the advantages that this feature allows. It makes it easier for platforms and the fundraisers. But as this happens, more challenges will arise. What you'll find is the burden of due diligence, um, the burden of um, risk management, the burden of credit scoring, and basically making sure that they get it right shifts closer towards the platform themselves, which therefore means it's never been more important for these platforms to make sure that these aforementioned factors are a ro as robust as possible to safeguard investors from unnecessary or unreasonable risk. Just quickly looking at the risks, so you can see here that you've got the, fa the, the factors on the left-hand side and then the severity of the risk in the, in the colored bars. So if you combine very high risk with high risk, the, the greatest worry for most platforms is actually the collapse of one or more practice, uh, platforms due to malpractice. The second most concerning is actually the notable increase in default rates or business failure rates. On the other side of the spectrum, the least worry for platforms is actually the crowding out of retail investors through institutionalization, and that aligns with our observation earlier. 
If we move on to regulation, um, maybe unsurprisingly, opinions are quite mixed and there lacks harmonization, um, just because countries have their own jurisdictions for different models, etc. Having said that, as long as the industry can grow sustainably and keep proving itself, you know, regulators are paying a lot more attention and in many cases trying to make sure that there's a, an environment for the platforms to thrive and compete with traditional incumbents. Internalizing this, the platforms are saying uh, from, well, existing, existing uh, regulations, 38% say it's appropriate or adequate, whereas for proposed regulation, 47%, uh, so a high 47% say it's appropriate or adequate. And then if we look at uh, too strict or excessive, platforms are hopeful of the future. So with existing regulation, 28% say it's excessive or too strict, whereas um, for proposed regulation, a smaller 22% say that is the case. So to quickly wrap this presentation up, there's absolutely no doubt that competition is going to intensify um, within the industry, but also from traditional incumbents. There's absolutely no doubt that we live in testing times with an uncertain economic environment, and there's absolutely uh, no doubt that there will be more and more scrutiny from investors and regulators alike. So if we quickly assume that this growth rate <coughs> continues by about 50%, um, we'll see in 2016 that it's probably going to break the 8 billion mark. Um, so therefore, perhaps it's less about short-term growth and more about long-term resilience and actually uniting together to ensure that we share knowledge and practice for the betterment of the industry. So if, if the industry can continue to promote financial inclusion, transparency, robust credit controls, superior customer service, as well as following best practice, then I believe that the industry can sustain momentum. Thank you very much. Thank you.